what can you say about beauty in evolution? So something that's, uh, maybe you can educate me, but something that's not quite an honest signal, that's just pure beauty, like so, peacock feathers. So there are things which we think operate closer to that. So there are these are the two kind of classic ideas of sexual selection, and both are probably true to certain degrees in various different species. One is the honest signal, or the, it's the kind of the handicap hypothesis, because you're holding yourself back whilst proving you can still do it. I, I ran the marathon, you know, carrying a couple of weights, you're obviously stronger than the guy who ran the marathon without. Um, and so that's why it's an honest signal and that's why it's a handicap. But the other one is what's called the sexy sons hypothesis. And the idea is a female might just find a male attractive for no other reason than random. There is some component of her brain or whatever it may be that that just looks cool. And you can actually sort of get this as a human. Like, forget forget human beauty. You, you can look at a bottle and go, that bottle's kind of nice and that bottle's kind of ugly. Where do you put, like, like, birds are interesting with this. Well, where do you put peacock feathers? So they're, they're probably more handicap hypothesis because the colors that go into them and the sheer size and shape. Oh, I see. Yeah, and yeah. You, these things basically can't fly. Um, they're really vulnerable to predators. Can the handicap hypothesis explain just how beautiful peacock feathers get? Because so, they go, what? They so go pro extreme. Pro probably not entirely. There's there's almost certainly randomness going on in there as well. And then the eye spots, we know that eye spots are attractive, are, are probably encoded in some way. Um, but yeah, so going back to the sexy suns, the idea is females prefer something different for whatever reason. And there might actually be some reasons females prefer things that are different. Different usually means separate and outside. And that usually comes with it variation like in inherently also oh, variation is evolutionary a turn on yeah basically wouldn't that man you're rolling the dice though aren't you yeah well you <laughs> bro, bro, so, so you you've you've got to remember again it's really easy to look at that sort of thing with a human perspective where uh, maximum reproductive output I think the the record there's there's some obscure record. It's something like sixty six children, which is probably apocryphal for a Russian woman who had loads of triplets and quads. But like humans don't have many offspring, but most animals lay dozens of eggs or hundreds of eggs or thousands of eggs at a time. So actually, so diversity pays off more there. So diversity can pay off. We we think that's probably a major part of the reason that sex evolved in the first place is it gives you resistance to changing environment and it gives you resistance to parasites and diseases, which often reproduce way faster than you do. You know, bacteria can divide in a few hours. We reproduce every 20 years. That's quite a difference. If we were all asexual clones and you're vulnerable to some disease, you're probably going to get wiped out. Look at the, you know, Irish potato famine or something like that. Um, so different may be appealing simply because it is different. It's giving you variation. Um, and there's at least some evidence for that. There's, um, sword tails. So anyone who keeps little fish, uh, if anyone who's a tropical fish, uh, keeper, uh, sword tails are really quite common little tropical fish that you can get in all kinds of aquarium shops. And they're a very boring fish shape, but the lower lobe of their tail has a big spike on it. And that's the name. And they're really close relatives of a group called the mollies, which basically don't have that. And in the wild, there are these are Amazonian fish. They don't usually encounter each other. But even if you go and get not even the domesticated form, because these things have been bred for you know decades at this point, you can go and get some wild mollies and give them a wild male sword tail. And they think he is so much better than all the male mollies. They will go for that one and they will preferentially mate with that one. We don't know the exact mechanism, but it appears to be it looks similar enough that I recognize it as a potential mate, but different enough that this is exciting mm -hmm. and then this is where the sexy sons kick in because the females are now assuming those animals are successful and they can hybridize or maybe it's just a male who just happens to be a little bit blue or a little bit red or whatever it may be um well the female offspring the daughters are probably going to inherit mother's preference i really like red and the males are probably going to have red in them because their dad had more red mm -hmm. so guess what the next generation does it's more red, and the females like more red. And you don't have to come back much further, and suddenly all the males are bright red. And that's closer to beauty than I think almost anything else would be with still a naturalistic explanation.
we kind of started talking about beauty from how much uh, social life. Yeah, a T-Rex might have. <laughs> a T-Rex might have. So uh, uh, just to kind of take that to a place of w- what we know and what we don't know. So can we kind of know something about their uh, their social life, where they lived, how they lived? So the very fact that they have these apparently sociosexually selected signals, the, the little crest and stuff in the head... So there's a branch of sexual selection called mutual sexual selection, and the the black swans are an advanced example of this. The, the classic sexual selection is, yeah, your peacocks and your lions and things like this. Males are bigger and more flamboyant and whatever it is, and they're doing all the competing. But you get mutual sexual selection, and this is really common in a whole bunch of things that people are familiar with but don't know. Loads of seabirds. Um, starlings, the common starling that we have in Europe and has been introduced into the U.S., Parrots, various other things, where basically males and females invest similarly in rearing the offspring. And so the idea generally, both with handicap and sexy son, but particularly with handicap, is the idea is the males are proving their worth. They're basically saying, I'm the biggest, strongest, healthiest, I've got the best genes, I should be the father of your offspring. They go around showing off and then mate with as many females as possible, while the females then do all the work and make the nest and look after the chicks and yeah or rear them or give birth or whatever it may be yada 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 and so the idea with mutual sexual selection is well what if there's not much food around things like puffins uh you know penguins in the arctic you know where the male sits with the egg and the female toddles off gets food and then comes back two months later or whatever it is um on their own they can't rear the offspring they have to have a male investment well now suddenly the male's now putting loads of effort in. So the male's now in the same position that a female would be in under the normal conditions. You don't want to be the sexiest, toughest, biggest male, and you can only mate once. All right, there's there's various cheats, but we won't get into that just yet. You're only going to mate once, and you're going to put all your effort into helping rearing offspring rather than chasing down as many girls as possible. Are you going to go for the biggest, fittest female as well, or are you going to go for the small, weedy one that doesn't look very well? you go for the best one. Well, how do you know that? Well, because she's got a crest as well. And so suddenly, you now get mutual ornamentation, just like the black swans, where the males are checking out the curliest females and the females are checking out the curliest males. And you'll see they mutually pair up. This is what we see with things like starlings. Males like the brightest females, females like the brightest males. They tend to form pairs. The darkest and least bright ones are obviously kind of left with each other at the bottom of the pile. They tend to pair up. But it means that when you get signals in both males and females, like every Triceratops or every Tyrannosaurus, it at least hints that they're going down this route and that they might cooperate for reproduction. Wow. Another like weak signal that tells a powerful yeah, story. Yeah, and the problem is it's compromised by lots of things. So that goes back to your earlier question about telling males and females apart. The vast majority of dinosaur species, like 90 plus percent, are known from a single specimen. And a specimen is not necessarily very complete at all. It might be a couple of bones. It might be one bone. It might be a tooth in a couple of cases. The actual number where we've got a decent number of real whole skeletons that we can actually compare to each other less than 10 probably more like five or six 